so windy. The conditions here, so cold, so damp. Some feat of engineering, and you think of the guys and girls that probably put this together uh, all them years ago. I mean, I'm struggling to be able to talk in these conditions and to think that this was built over several winters. It's colossal. However, he's going over, well, up the valley of the river Ribble. We're at the top of that valley. At Ribble Head. Yeah, yeah, course. Ribble Head, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then down the valley of the River Eden into uh, the Eden through Valley. To Carlisle, yes. Yeah. We did, and what I contributed to uh, perhaps gave a gave the political side a, an excuse to save the life. <laughs> Site, yeah. So it's just making sure that we preserve that as much as possible yeah. as well as to the building that we're going to be working on. Yeah. Yeah, well this is it, Station Master's house, the original Riverbed station. Do you know, it was like 10 shillings a day. That's what you'd get paid if you were a navvy and you were going to build this railway line. 10 shillings a day. And that equates to about 30 quid in today's money. And I believe that wasn't too bad for a day's work. Mind you, most of it was probably spent on, on beer to keep them going so in conditions like this. And that 10 shillings was being paid to about 2,300 men to build this line just to get trains from London all the way into Scotland. A knee-jerk reaction because they couldn't come to an agreement with rival railway companies and take trains via T-Bay. So they wanted to build their own line. Well, the whole thing, in the, the statistics are 24 arches. Yeah. It's the longest viaduct by quite a long way on the line. And it's actually built on a curve. Right. Um, you can see it from this side, the curve, can't you? You, you absolutely can. And uh, not a huge curve. Yeah. But uh, made sense, really, because these abutments, these huge great embankments. Yeah. Uh, were constructed by tipping spoil at the northern end that had come out of the cuttings and Bleemore Tunnel. And it rather depended on how big those abutments were going to be. Yeah. And they couldn't really tell for definite until right. they were made. So in the end it worked out as 24 arches. Right. It is a, it's the one where I think if you ask someone to picture, picture a viaduct with a steam engine running yeah. across it. Yeah. And this, this is the one that comes to the forefront of many people's minds. So what we were able to do is, um, within the team, we've designed a remediation solution and we've used some new technology in that, in how we've, how we've come to the right solution, an appropriate solution right. for this asset. Right. We found um, some cracks and we found some splits in the structure. So what we've done is we've designed a solution that will be, that's appropriate, um, takes uh, you know, takes account of the age, um, the, the sensitivity of this asset, um, but we'll repair it and strengthen it. As part of the consenting process, they asked us to undertake detailed water and sampling analysis uh, of the structure just to inform us of the exact um, composition of the existing water, which then would duplicate uh, as part of our works. And for me, I'm so proud to be able to maintain um, iconic and historical assets such as this 
These are so important in our history and so important that we make sure that these are fit for generations to come. And also the money that we're investing will help passengers once they return back next year and bring tourists and attract leisure travellers to this iconic railway line. The former Navi construction site yeah, and yeah. The, the camp, uh, wasn't it? Yeah, and the settlement itself. Um, so obviously it was just liaising with the, the two parties to make sure that we can limit the disturbance yeah. as, much, as much as we could. Yeah. Um, obviously no excavations were uh, were specified and um, we've had to lay stone down on the, onto the existing so we can allow our uh, materials to be placed in. Um, so it can remain in service for the company. So you can focus your time and your energies really on where it needs to be the most and it, it, it's, I suppose it's a safer method uh, because you're not having you know people scaling the viaduct time to do an intimate inspection and this is historic as well and you can keep this data on file and do, you can, and I suppose you could look back at this you know in years to come to see how things are progressing or compare it to new surveys. That's exactly right. Yeah. So we'll, we've got then um, got a baseline. Yeah. Effectively, which we can look back to and could compare future surveys if we, if we, if we I'm sure we will do. We cover just south of Crewe on the West Coast Main Line, then through to the Scottish borders north of Carlisle, but that also takes into Liverpool, Manchester, the Settle Carlisle Line, and the Cumbrian coast. Brilliant. And you work closely with the Great North Rail project on the assets, making sure that they're well maintained, they're looking after things, beautiful structures like this one. You know, I'm responsible for the day-to-day -day operations and maintenance of the of the railway uh, in full right across the route. Future surveys of similar nature. Yeah. And we can see, you know, we can answer the question what's changed. Yeah. And we'll be able to see the effectiveness of the repairs that we're doing now and if any other um, yeah. defects come to light in, in time. Quite often when they were building this line there was camps where not just the navvies lived, because bear in mind they were here for years, the families were here and children were here. It was a massive, massive operation, 2,300 men and their families with horses and everything else you can just picture. In the summertime I bet it was grand but in the winter, boy. It was bleak. And of course, unusually for a viaduct, it's, it's not going over a watercourse. No, it's not. It's, or, it's... <laughs> or, or a road of any great consequence. Yeah. It was merely a way of uh, uh, covering the, putting the railway track up in the sky. Yeah. Um, because the Midland Railway had quite deliberately chosen the awkward way. The thing about this railway line that people miss, because it's called the Settle to Carlisle Line. Yeah. Now think about it, who in their right Victorian minds would want to build a difficult yeah. railway line yeah. from Settle to Carlisle? And of course that was not why it was built. Yeah. It was built to connect the London terminal of the Midland Railway, St Pancras, St. No Pancras less, Station, to Scotland, to Glasgow and Edinburgh. Well they couldn't strike a deal could they to go through T-Bay? Okay. Over Logill Viaduct, it would have been, wouldn't it? Yeah, the London and North Western, Western Railway, yeah. Were as awkward as they could be oh, to the Midland. And uh, so the Midland, uh, in frustration, thought, well, we'll use these two river valleys and yeah. build a third main line yeah. straight up the middle of the country. Yeah. And then miraculously, the London and North Western came over all cooperative. Yeah, they did well. Because they could see competition <laughs> looming in a big way. <laughs> But, so they were uh, going to scrap it then, weren't they? They were. Yeah. The, uh, the um, uh, Midland Railway actually applied to Parliament to withdraw their act yeah. to build it. Yeah. Uh, but by then, a, uh, forgive me, head of steam had built up an expectation that it was going to be built, and Parliament insisted, no, yeah. you will build it. And so the Midland Railway built it reluctantly, yeah. um, having just spent a colossal amount of their money on St Pancras. Yeah. But that said, isn't it remarkable? Yeah. The, the standard of which they did these structures. Yeah. Unnecessarily ornate uh, stations, especially. So it was done Beautiful. with reluctance, but with immense Victorian style.
I'll come across many different people who have a connection to this railway line, people who like the Staycation Express, run the trains along this celebrity line, and then the engineers of the BR days back in the late 80s and early 90s who did the testing, the maintenance testing, to see if it was viable to work on the viaduct. The viaduct consumed a lot of money. Without that viaduct, this whole of this line just wouldn't purely exist. Uh, my name is Tony Fruschini. Um, at the time of the uh, work that was carried out, the original work was carried out to the Double Head Viaduct, I was a resident engineer for British Rail, uh, based in Lancaster. And um, I was asked to go and carry out a trial of repairs because uh, British Rail needed to uh, convince everybody that their price of six or seven million, I think, for repairing the structure, this is 30 years ago, of course, um, was a fair and reasonable price. They decided that uh, they would carry out a trial repair. This was done. Uh, English Heritage sort of objected to that's not a trial, you know, you caught them. I think the idea was if we do six, we'll have the money. <laughs> we'll be given the money to do the lot. I've been spent, done a quarter of it. So we'll pay, we'll pay for two. So we chose, uh, sorry, two, two piers. So we chose the King Pier 12 at the centre because it was easy access and the adjacent pier uh, 13. And by that means, we would have done a typical part, uh, the most essential parts of the structure, we've done a typical piece. Um, so a handwritten, handwritten, the handwritten um, recommendations that are made uh, of the existing, uh, how to prepare this paper. Um, we carried out the work, I took, said what I thought should be done. Uh, this was written up as 75 pages of handwriting uh, went into this. And it printed up as a glossy, uh, which went to the Ministry of Transport. Um, that for discussions with English Heritage and the Ministry of Transport because the closure notice was still in for the line at that stage. When the, the line was repeated about, probably about 12 months after, after we finished here with the trial. And um, the next thing I got was a, somebody rang me up one afternoon and said, you're going to get down there and we're going to waterproof it. And, um, we've got possession, we've got to do some drawings in the office and we're going to waterproof it in um, October I think of the following year so it'll be 1908 maybe 89 um, so within a three week possession we did that that bit cost about 400,000 I think as you know I champion all that sort of thing keeping lines open and not just building new railway stations or electrifying railway lines but also keeping some of our heritage and this is pure heritage and this is one of the reasons why we've got the Staycation Express the charter service train if you can call it running regular services that happened in the summer which was a great success running along this line making this line exposed to enthusiasts and to the tourists giving it a feature giving it celebrity status so oh, yeah, well this is it, Station Master's House, the original Ribblehead Station House that uh, is owned by the Settle Carlisle Trust and we refurbed it earlier this year and it was basically just a question of, it was a bit bling and we had to sort of de-bling it a bit we put in a new carpets, new furniture, new lights, new pictures and you know just took it back to its original style and put in things like new curtains actually it's a really nice sort of it's property homely. to rent very homely it's not over the top it was a bit didn't quite have the right feel before yeah whereas now it's got um, much more of a homely feel sort of neutral colors it's modern it's fresh but we've kept the original features such as the fireplace oh, but this warms up really quickly oh yeah it? i mean at the moment it's only it's, um, see i'm hovering yeah, over the yeah, radiator yeah. it's only 15 degrees because it's unoccupied because of covid but when it's um if you fire the fire the rads up 
it's really cozy. So I've got two hats on. One is a sort of joint hat as a trustee of the Settle Carlisle Trust and a um, non-exec director of the development company that provides funding for things like um, additional staff at Settle and Appleby, um, the onboard catering, that kind of thing, group bookings. And the other hat is Rail Charter Services, which is a new um, daily dedicated timetable tourist offering uh, whereby this summer we ran a regular timetable tourist service along the line, multi-daily tourist service along the line. So this is interesting because it's the first time really this has ever happened on a mainline um, network rail infrastructure. This was a timetable service that so we were running multi-daily trains in a timetable path. And what we find with the Settle Carlisle line is it's somewhat different from many other routes and it has some sort of fairly unique markets. You've got obviously locals, uh, you've got long distance travellers between Leeds and Glasgow who use the route, but there's also a, a large percentage of tourists who, who, and that market's been relatively untapped in the past. The, it, uh, the, the local services are not really designed for tourists. They tend to be two carriage trains designed in sort of high density for commuters. Um, and they serve the line well in terms of intermediate stops. So rail charter services were set up in conjunction with Northern and the Rail Delivery Group and the DFT to provide a private dedicated tourist operation that would, if you, lay, if you like, with, um, you know, with demand in the summer. And the service was made up of traditional intercity Mark III coaches, all first class configuration. We had guides on board, we had a catering trolley, um, and we, we're not trying to emulate what the steam charters do, because that's a heritage experience. This is about providing modern day rolling stock for, not so much for enthusiasts, but for tourists and families who want to go on the line and want to experience the line, but find it hard you know, to do that on, on the regular service because it's simply not designed for that. So there you go. I would have loved to have done a lot more footage and talking, as it were, around the area, but as you can appreciate, the clouds are looking absolutely dirty as anything. It's, uh, it's very bleak. And it just gives me a sense of appreciation of the 200 lives that were lost on site at the campsites along here and the bodies were all buried at Chapinley Dale Church just a little bit further in that direction about a mile away and in, in fairness they weren't all fatalities because of the line a lot of it was to do with disease a lot of children perished in the family camps that were here of smallpox smallpox was uh, raged through the camps but that was just comes with the territory of this territory not only am I happy to come here and see such a fantastic structure being well looked after and learning about the future of this line staying open, keeping things rolling and going for you and I, it's also a little bit of a homage for me to come here and understand and learn more about those who are connected to the railway, not necessarily from the beginning but through the whole of its lifespan, making its way through one of the bleakest, harshest conditions of England, but definitely one of the prettiest. Thank you.